Hello and welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast. In today's episode, we are going to dive in and talk about yoga, philosophy, and how that relates to parenting. I will say that I could have really benefited from knowing more about yoga philosophy as a newer parent. Now, I did find yoga pretty early on as a parent, but I wasn't introduced to yoga philosophy until after my third baby was born. I really was showing up to yoga thinking, okay, this is about a night out, some stretching, some exercise. And then I realized, wow, I feel better. And it was the tiny little messages that the yoga teacher would say, you know, to notice what was happening in my body to be a little kinder to myself with the messages toward myself when I thought about my body, to find gratitude and contentment in different ways. So there were definitely small messages that had yoga philosophy weaved in throughout them, but it wasn't until I was right in yoga teacher training where I felt like, wow, I can take this and use this in my life to give me some more strength, some more patience, Just a real feeling of like being supported. So I'm curious to hear from you as a listener. When did you really start to think about yoga philosophy? And how has that impacted how you do what you do in the world? Maybe that's parenthood. Maybe it's some other caregiving. Maybe it's with your job or or something else in your life. I'm really curious to hear from you. If you have thoughts to share about this, I'd love to hear those And you can send us a voice message or you can leave a note in the show notes. That's over at theconnectedyogateacher.com slash 373 for today's episode. Okay, I feel like I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm giving you the link for today's episode and you haven't even had an introduction of like who I am or who is our guest today. (laughs) So if you're new here, let me uh, say hello. I'm your host, Shannon Crow. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And this podcast is being recorded on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people who were here on Turtle Island long before my settler ancestors arrived. I'm a Canadian yoga teacher, I'm a mom of three, an entrepreneur, and a forever student who loves to ask a lot of questions. (laughs) That's why I think podcasting feels like a good fit. I love also that we get to hang out and learn together. And this podcast was made for you, the yoga teacher, because I remember how I felt leaving that first yoga teacher training, just stepping out into the world as a yoga teacher as someone who is running a small business. And, you know, I wish I would have had a little more support in those days. So this podcast is a place where you can connect to other yoga teachers like today's guest, Claire, and to ideas and information. And really the main goal is so that you can feel supported. If you are a returning listener, thanks for hanging out again I'm just really honored that you spend your time here and it means a lot. Today's episode is powered by Offering Tree. I use and love this software in my own business because it makes everything simple and automated, like bookings, payments, Zoom links, reminders, and so much more. And we have a special discount code for you over at offeringtree.com slash Shannon. Today's episode is also brought to you by Pelvic Health Professionals. And before you fast forward through this, (laughs) I have some big news that feels scary and at the same time feels very right. And I want to share that with you. It's related to our Pelvic Health Professionals membership. So if you haven't heard of that, over there we connect yoga teachers and other professionals to the most up-to-date information about pelvic health. We hire pelvic health experts to come in, talk to our members, answer questions, and we also have trainings in there and just a real resource of learning, as well as we did five yoga series in the last year or two so that you can learn how to share this with your yoga students. You can actually take part in a class and see how it feels, try it on, and then share it with your community. 
So I'll get into some more details probably about this big news, maybe today, later in this episode, but definitely in future episodes. And the main thing is to know right now is that pelvic health professionals, as it is right now, is going to change in some capacity as of August the 1st, 2024. So I'm prepared to close pelvic health professionals at this time. But I'm also leaving the door open in case one of our members wants to take the reins and run this business as their own. So I'm throwing that out there to our members. They will have already gotten an email about this, and I will definitely keep you in the loop here on the podcast as much as possible because I think it's helpful to hear, you know, how do other people deal with big changes like this in their business? Now, if you want access, to everything inside our membership, the trainings, the calls, the yoga sessions, you can still join and learn with us until the end of July of 2024. And if you want to hear what it's like from someone else, I'll let Claire, who's today's guest, tell you her thoughts on pelvic health professionals. So for me, pelvic health professionals has been a wonderful opportunity to deepen my understanding of the pelvis. And as I love, Shannon always says that everyone has a pelvis. <laughs> and um, within that, to not only navigate what can feel like a, a confusing and complicated area of the human anatomy, but to also connect with other professionals, not just yoga teachers, being a yoga teacher, but really hearing and learning what's happening and what's really current practice for physios, doulas, other birth professionals, um, Chiropractors, exercise physiologists, it really, I think, helps um, have a more well rounded experience and understanding, and also helps to understand what your scope of practice is and where you can either out refer people or um, go to for your own professional support and learning. Uh, the other thing I really love about pelvic health professionals is the uh, the biopsychosocial uh, kind of approach that comes a lot in that. Um, and uh, again, as a yoga teacher, I would more call it kind of like the five coaches. So really looking at all the layers. Um, my two favorite uh, episodes or um, guest speaker calls that have been in there have been um, Leslie Howard talking about the energetics of the pelvis, which I think I um, hassled Shannon about getting her back on to that. But um that is something I'd been so intrigued about for so long and to hear someone with such experience talking about it was wonderful. Um, also really love people such as Carolyn Van Dyke and really talking about the um, not just the biopsychosocial approach but, again, that um, that alternative to just musculoskeletal and looking at um, a more holistic, grounded approach to that uh, supporting people with that area of the So to check all of this out, to join Pelvic Health Professionals, go to pelvichealthprofessionals.com. And then later today, after my chat with Claire, and for sure, like I said, in future podcast episodes, I want to keep you in the loop with this. I want to tell you why this change is happening, how it's feeling, and what I'm learning from it. And I'd love to hear your questions about it as well. Like I said, Every entrepreneur, every small business goes through change at some point, whether that's small or big, and it can feel really overwhelming at times. And I have felt that with this change coming up, but also I know that there are big, exciting things coming. So, all right. I will get into that in a little bit at the end of today's episode, but right now, Let's get into today's topic around yoga philosophy and parenting. Now, if you are interested in diving into some more episodes about yoga philosophy, I will link to those in the show notes. So we've definitely covered this before in three different episodes. We talked about finding support in yoga philosophy. We talked about yoga philosophy and how that relates to business and yoga philosophy and colonialism. Like I said, I'll link to those three episodes. But today we are exploring how yoga philosophy can support us in a different phase of our lives, parenthood. When Claire Holloway reached out to me to propose this as a podcast episode, 
she included a really amazing explanation. And it's one of the reasons why I was like, yeah, I want to book this. So Claire's words are these that I read. To clarify, parenthood, the term, is used here inclusively for the journey of matrescence. I hope I'm saying that right, Claire. (laughs) Which includes contraception, pregnancy, postpartum, and parenting. It's applicable to birthing people, their partners, new or prospective parents, and anyone who works to support these people. So I just loved that Claire brought so much inclusivity to this. And also that came into our discussion today. I'm excited for you to hear and learn from our conversation because, oh my goodness, parenting is one of the most challenging jobs on this planet, for sure. Anyone who's ever looked after children for a short amount of time or every single day, day in, day out, seven days a week, (laughs) you know, you know how much goes into this. And I really feel like yoga can support us especially on the tough days. So Claire is the founder of the Center of Bright Beginnings. She offers yoga, corrective exercise, and educational support for those embarking upon or moving through the journey of matrescence, not only those identifying as mothers, but any parents and caregivers or parents-to-be. She studies and shares yoga through the lens of her personal experience of becoming and being a mother. In our conversation today, Claire shares a little bit about the work that she does, how she got to doing this, and her postpartum journey. We talk about yoga philosophy, and Claire helps to break down how we can apply these teachings from so long ago to life today as parents. We also talk about moderating our energy as parents when so much of it goes to our children, how to avoid comparing ourselves with the quote unquote perfect parents on social media, and the many decisions that are connected to parenting and birthing and so much more. This is a really full discussion for anyone who is a parent, future parent, caregiver, or if you are a yoga teacher or person who supports or knows parents in your own life. I cannot wait for you to hear this episode, so let's dive right in. Welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast, Claire. It's so great to have you here today. Thank you, Shannon. I'm so excited to be here and to speak with you in person after feeling like I've known you for so long through listening to your podcast and being in the Pelvic Health um, Professionals Membership. Well, I am so excited that we get to meet in person, like virtually, um, because I feel like I've been seeing like you for a long time, probably in the Connected Yoga Teacher Facebook group. You've popped in lots of answers to questions um, in that group, and I've just seen your name. And so now we finally get to chat. It's really exciting. So good. (laughs) Tell our listeners, because we're going to talk about parenting and how yoga philosophy comes into all of that. But before we do that, in case people don't know who you are, tell us um, what's the work that you do and who do you do it for? Sure. So I might start with where I do it. So I just like to acknowledge the land that I'm on presently and the land where I do work and teach yoga. And that is um, the land of the Wajak people of the Nyunga Nation. And here in Perth, Western Australia, it's called Wajak Buja, which means that Buja is their land. Um, and I've only actually been on this land for about 18 months now. I moved uh, from Lutruwita, which is Tasmania, which is right at the southern end, um, little island at the southern end of Australia. Um, I moved around a bit, but I just wanted to acknowledge those more recent places that I've been living and working. Um, and then in terms of what I do and who I do it for, so uh, my uh, business is the Centre of Bright Beginnings and it's basically about the start of new beginnings in life and most specifically around the perinatal period. So looking at the whole journey of matrescence, and I might just define that for people who haven't heard the term before. So matrescence is uh, defined originally as the journey of becoming a mother. But with the work that I do, I like to broaden that a little bit, make it a little bit more inclusive and uh, a, a bit of a larger overview. So looking at it being from that moment when someone, even the idea comes into their head that they would like to start 
that journey of parenthood. So from conception and the idea of wanting to conceive onwards and that it applies not just to the birthing person, but also to another parent or support person that's involved because they are very much impacted by that journey as well. So that's the, uh, I guess, the target group that I, most of my offerings are for. So that's everything from yeah, fertility, conception, pregnancy, and the postpartum period. My specific areas of passion are really um, passionate in supporting people who are going through that period and experiencing chronic pain. I've been on a long journey of that myself. Um, so that's an area I've really kind of gone down a bit of a rabbit hole into and where the Pelvic Health Professionals membership has been a really great support. And also, I'm really passionate about um, advocating for and supporting for continuity of care, not just in the uh, pregnancy period, but also for at least a whole year postpartum. So I presume it's similar in other Western um, countries, but it may be, I know some are better than Australia is, but here, there's very much um, support that's kind of provided depending which system you're in up until the six weeks postpartum mark. And then it's kind of like, right, tick all the, bo- all the boxes are good. You're ready to go. See you later. Have fun. And that's actually when it starts to get hard, when all that excitement and joy and newness has started to wear off and the reality starts to sink in. So like you said, this is really when things start to kick up. Like I remember those postpartum days. And my oldest is 25. And I remember like the feeling of, oh my gosh, how am I going to get through this? So you were inspired by, you said your own um, persistent pain. Also from like that journey, can you talk to us about like, what was your postpartum time like? And what inspired you to then really focus on this time with parents? Yeah, so um, there was two main challenging facets with my own postpartum journey, especially a lot of this came out of my first uh, pregnancy and that first entry into motherhood for me and parenthood for me and my husband. Uh, So I was living remotely on a remote island in the Northern Territory of Australia on the land of um, Anandaliaqua which is, um, there's there's lots of islands up there and we were on one of the larger islands there. So having a pregnancy and then a small child in a remote area with um, very limited both health support and just general support, didn't have any family or anything there, um, that definitely, I guess, heightens a lot of those, those postpartum challenges. And then also uh, for me, so... It, my my chronic pain issues started when I was late pregnancy. I had um, a nasty fall, slipped in some water, pretty much did the splits, uh, which I really didn't want to be doing at 32 weeks pregnant yeah. and ended up with an inguinal hernia, which is a hernia in your um, like your pelvic area. And that triggered off all sorts of um, pain. And then um, obviously with the weight of the baby and continuing to carry the baby, it was a lot of pain. And then postpartum, I had to get it repaired, but um, the repair surgery just actually made the pain worse. Um, the surgery itself was a success, but I think because of all the pain pathway, it was just um, it just triggered it more. So um, having limited access there to allied health services, um, I did have a physio I could see, but they weren't a specialist in women's health and. Um, not having all, much of that knowledge myself at the time, um, I just, a lot of the time I just had to suffer through. I didn't see another way because at that time so much of your, your thoughts, your physical, everything you're doing is caught up in looking after your child. So, um, yeah, so it wasn't actually, I actually just got to the point where we ended up moving, leaving the island, which we were never planning on staying there forever. but. In the end, I just had to. I needed to go somewhere where I could have more um, more physical support available to me. So that was when we moved to Tasmania. Um, but it was during that time that I had actually um, more to keep, um, as I say, my brain from going to mush when I was <laughs> going through that real early motherhood phase. I had decided I'd always practice yoga and love yoga. I had decided to do yoga teacher training course uh, rem- uh, online. 
just to more for to deepen my yoga practice rather than with the goal of teaching. And as I started to delve more and more into the philosophy, I noticed, and I, it was almost like a chicken and egg scenario, I noticed that the journaling I was doing to help me with my chronic pain, a lot of the themes I was writing about was coming back to things like the yama and niyama, so those principles that are really core to the eight limbs of yoga. And then as I became more aware of those principles through my learning, I started to almost like develop my journaling and my thoughts around those. And then as I progressed in my yoga teaching and wanted to bring that in more, um, I realized that all that I wanted to say about it couldn't fit in just like a general yoga class, even if it was for pre or postpartum people. So um, eventually, yeah, I ended up making a whole separate program, which is um, Practical Yoga Philosophy for Parenthood. So uh, really the chronic pain was kind of the, the catalyst for a lot of that. So, That's yeah. amazing. And it Thank really you helped. for sharing that yeah. because I feel like it's those times when we really go through something that we, um, you know, we dig deep and then often end up sharing that with other people. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I think it um it when it does uh come from that that way, it it does help you to have that empathy with people as well. I think when you are teaching it, um having having gone through it. It doesn't mean you have to go through something to teach it, but it is it is helpful when you're relating to people, I think. Yeah, for sure. So then, you know. We know that the philosophy of yoga was written a long time ago before, like things were very different when yoga first hit the scene, what, 5,000 plus years ago? (laughs) So how is it still applicable to parenting now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's sometimes hard to think like, why would I have taken the teachings of, as they presume some sages who were you know meditating um away from society and why would that be relevant to us who are in this more um um, home-based domesticated situation at that time of life with parenting but I really believe that the the fundamental teachings of yoga are uh kind of transcend that They're, they're they speak to the whole experience of being human um but it's then I guess, and I think too that the sages, although they would have been off doing their thing, they they start their own life in society, in whatever the society was like at the time. So it's not like they wouldn't have had an awareness of that. But I think it's more um, about uh, though topics can seem a little bit um, esoteric or removed from the day to day mundane, but it's just about. Um, uh, I guess simplifying and condensing some of them to a more um, reachable format for people, especially parents are so busy, like having time to sit down and actually like chew on something that heavy, which yoga philosophy can be heavy as any philosophy can if you're um, caught up in a lot of other things. I think it's about um, distilling that a little bit for people so that they have uh, an entry point for them to then start to be able to um, explore it for themselves as well. And I do feel that all the teachings of yoga, being a really um, secular and inclusive teaching at its heart, um, because it does transcend um, any dogmatic teachings, that there is that opportunity with the yoga teachings to um, essentially uh, take, take from the teaching the the things that apply to your particular moment. And, I mean, yoga is about union and part of union is being in that present moment. So how does this apply for my present state of being right now? And giving people, empowering them with the permission to go um, that they are, um, you know, they're worthy of part of this, of applying it to now, even if they're definitely not feeling enlightened in any way at all, um, that it doesn't mean that they can't assess the teachings, yeah. So I'm just thinking back to like my days when I was like, oh my gosh. Like I was thrilled that I had a baby because that was the goal. And also at the same time, so overwhelmed by the smallest things. Like I just remember, okay, it's a good day if everyone like goes to bed, bed and 
in some clean pajamas, like all of us included. <laughs> and I was like, I felt like, <laughs> you know, I had this idea of parenthood that would be like, we're going to color together and read books together. And I didn't, like, I babysat a lot when I was growing up. I had a younger brother. It's not like I was sheltered from what babies were like. But being in it 24 hours a day, as you know, 24 seven, like you, just, you, you don't get a break from it. I don't know if I would have listened to the philosophy much then. Like if I would have been like, it would have been nice to know ahead of time, but I didn't, mm-hmm. I had no idea about the yoga philosophy. So if you were talking to a brand new parent, how would you yep. start to bring this in? Yes, for sure. And that, that's exactly what I've tried to do with um, the way I teach and bring in the philosophy to parents. So um, I love I love your recollections because I, I feel like I was like, yeah, that was me. <laughs> that was me too. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> so a couple of ones. I'll, I'll just give you a few examples because um, I do lean quite heavily on the yama and niyama because I feel that of the philosophies, they are – they are, I would say, a little bit more on the masculine side of energy in terms of the very logical um, and a little bit more straightforward. So I think they're a great starting point when we do live in a society that tends towards the logical. Um, <laughs> and and that I, I feel that's why they're more easier to, um, to distill down essentially, even though there is so much depth in them. If I just use one or two of them as an example, so if we look at say brahmacharya, which can be translated as uh, moderation or energy management, so um, energy management is a massive one in parenthood, as you said, like just getting through the day, just making sure everyone's fed and everyone gets to bed at some kind of time is is huge, and uh, so it's about. Um, acknowledging the period of life and going, okay, the way I manage my energy has radically shifted in this past however many days, weeks or months. How can I adapt to that now to match that? So to come back into, I don't like to use the word balance, but to moderate that. So if all of a sudden so much more of my energy is going into, um, you know, being around my children and connecting to them and thinking about them, is there a moment in the day, even just a little bit, where I can then redirect that energy towards myself, for example? So thinking about that flow of energy. Or another, um, uh, and sorry, uh, I should mention then a practical example of that. So uh, a practical example I do in the online version of the course, um, just so people can feel it in their body and start to get an idea, is actually just a simple balance pose. So coming to, you don't even have to get all the way into tree pose, but just standing on one leg <laughs> and starting to notice how even in that stillness, there's this there's this like idea and this ideal and you see it on social media everywhere of like this perfect mum life or whatever it is with you know, the beautiful um, nursery room and yeah, all the, everything yeah. is clean and the, the washing um. is folded up. Um, <laughs> and um, uh, <laughs> and just like coming onto one leg and feeling that balance pose, but then realising that even in the balance, that there's all these micro movements happening to keep you there all through the little muscles of the foot, up the leg, into the upper body. And then thinking back to, okay, the way that you're holding the family together at that time, there's all these little micro thoughts going in your head, micro movements, um, you know, reaching out one arm to do one thing, holding baby in the other, all these things. Um, And I I guess it's just highlighting that there never is true balance and that we can stop uh, beating ourselves up for not actually achieving that. And that then, I mean, all of the yama and niyama flow into each other, but just even that simple awareness can bring more compassion to ourselves. So ahimsa. And then in bringing more compassion to ourselves, we can start to look at um, the parigraha, which is that um, that non-attachment. So perhaps that can start us to even a little bit, just loosen a little bit of that grip on our lives being perfect and 
um, our house being perfectly clean mm-hmm. or whatever it is that we're clinging to for that sense of control. So, yeah, so obviously I could just keep going, but just to give you a brief example how um, it's just these these little snippets of the of the concepts and um, almost like piece by piece just starting to to bring them in. And, um, yeah, just um, everything I do with the teaching with this is really short, simple practices because as, as we were talking before we came onto the call, uh, as a parent, you, you're so time poor or you feel so time poor and being told, oh, you know, just um, come and do this one-hour yoga class can be like, oh, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but if you can say just stand on one leg for a minute, <laughs> or whatever it is, it doesn't have to be a um, an asana, of course. Um, then uh, I think it starts to be a little bit more approachable to to bring those concepts in. That's amazing. I want to highlight that. Also, when I had my babies, there was no Instagram, no TikTok. Facebook was around a little bit, but not like it is now. Um, And I really feel for parents who are comparing themselves to someone who literally makes it look different than it is. Or I don't know, maybe, for example, my daughter is 18 and she follows some Instagram and TikTok. I'm not sure something on social media where it's like someone's kind of dressed like a pioneer and they're a homesteader and they're like, you know, making, they've just gone out and milked the cow and then they're, they're making some butter and it's got a pretty pattern on it. Plus they've got like four kids around them. And I I said, why don't you do, my kitchen was like a disaster and I was cooking and she was like, you should like, you should see this lady who does this. And I go, why don't you hit record? And I'll just complain about that lady that does that. Well, my kitchen looks like this because this is actually what it's like to like sometimes cook and raise kids and, you know, and I think, my gosh, we're hard. When you talk about the Apari Graha, like I know how I was clinging to this like idea of perfection because once you have that baby, you want to, you want you want to make their life perfect. I did, and that is impossible. <laughs> like letting go of that. Yeah, we need like oh more gosh, like yes. just forget it, grandma energy or something. Like, I'm so grateful actually for the grandmas in my life that were like, that's not really going to matter at the end of the day. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. There's so much. There's so much shedding and so much letting go, and there's so much opportunity for that. And if if the shedding and the letting go doesn't happen, then it can just build and build and lead to so much unnecessary suffering um, yeah. without us even realizing. Um, and look, I'm a <laughs> I'm a um, what's the word? Um, a little bit of a hypocrite in terms of I've definitely um, been clinging person as well, and it's uh, one of my control is one of my things I'm constantly working on letting go of. So. Um, I think it's the more the more out of control things feel, the more we cling to whatever we feel that we can control. I remember at one point being becoming so obsessed with like actually getting the floor cleaned, right? And I'd like do one tiny square patch and then have to do something with baby and then come back to the next one. And it would never happen. And it wasn't until I just looked at myself and realized how crazy this concept was and just went what are you doing? <laughs> and yeah, that, that, that's a paragraph. Letting go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, I can remember being in yoga teacher training and learning about a paragraha and doing this meditation until it finally like sunk in. Because do you find this when you talk about yoga philosophy, you could be like, yeah, here are the yamas and the yamas and here's what it means and da da da. But there's something very different when you I don't know. I don't even know how to articulate it, but it was like this moment in meditation where I was like, oh, if I, I had this visual of like, if I hold on with like my fists clenched tight, I actually can't open them and let anything else in. If I hold so, so tight to this 
these expectations that I had. And that all came in meditation. I feel like that was a huge gift because I I had just had baby number three and maybe she was six months old or something. Maybe she was a year old. (laughs) So long ago. Connected yoga teachers, I'm popping in here quick to tell you how Offering Tree is a really amazing all-in-one software option, especially if you're already busy with life. Many of you listeners are parents or caregivers, and as we all know, that's a full-time job. I get it. I raised three humans into adulthood and ran my business in these years as well, and I wish that Offering Tree existed when I was running around teaching 16 classes a week with a notebook and class cards on paper, tracking who paid and what classes they attended. Oh my goodness. I'm just taking like a big breath here for a moment, thinking about those days. It was a lot. And in those years as well, I used a lot of different softwares in yoga studios. Frankly, one of them which you probably know which one it is, had way too many bells and whistles and came with a huge price tag to match. And it just made life really complicated when I had to use that as a studio manager and also as a teacher. And so when I found Offering Tree and I realized how simple and easy it was to use, I told all the yoga teachers and studios I knew about it. I love that that there are time zones with this, especially now that we're teaching online, that you can send out Zoom links, email reminders, text reminders, waivers. You can do online payments. And all of this is automated and simple because of Offering Tree. So if you want to have more time for the fun parts of your life and less time in front of the computer or a paper tracking system and spreadsheets, (laughs) check out Offering Tree. You can also use it to build your website or... If you already have a website like I do, you can integrate it with your existing website. There's a 50% discount code for you over at offeringtree.com slash Shannon. That's offeringtree.com slash Shannon and Shannon has two N's. Alrighty, let's get back into today's episode with Claire. What other parts of the philosophy have helped you in your parenting? Yeah, so um, the the really one of the really core ones for me, and this this one I want to do a whole other course on, but um, <laughs> um, is one of the underlying themes of the Bhagavad Gita. And forgive me for not being amazing at quoting particular lines and sutras and all that, but um, really one of the underlying themes, and a paragraha can be actually related to this too, but. It's about um, bhakti and letting go of the concern about the outcome of your action. So, so often I think we overthink things and then we don't do them because of the fear rather than or the worry of like how will this person perceive it or, you know, what will be the outcome or like is this going to be really good for me in the end um, versus just, taking right action and accepting that we did our bit and the rest will be what it will be. And Which something one, that I... one did you say that is? Sorry, I feel like I missed Oh, it. I said that it's um so that it's just one of the underlying themes of the Bhagavad Gita uh, because obviously um, Arjuna is uh, in the story. He's hesitating about going into battle because he's got loved ones on the other side and he doesn't want to act. And Krishna, um, one of the really underlying themes is about um, taking the right action as opposed to stopping and not acting because of the fear. And, um, yeah, I think I've I've come back to that a lot where I was uh, so worried about um, – I think there's so much worry in parenthood when when everything is new, everything you're doing it for the first time. There's so much, as you said, like the 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 scape of social media has changed so much since in the last 18 years, say since you were first a parent versus say someone like myself having children now. Um, there's so much, so much information accessible through those platforms. Whether 
whether it's grounded in fact or not, <laughs> that it can really put you into this state of fear of like, oh, am I doing this right? Oh, no, man, they're doing it this way. And if I do it this way, someone's going to criticize me because there's there's co-sleeping and there's not co-sleeping and there's right. attachment parenting and there's, um, I don't know, <laughs> disciplining your kid this way or not disciplining them at all and all these things. Um, you can just be frozen and just then not do anything about it or um, not really go, well, this is my way and this is how I'm going to do it. Um, And so that has given me a lot of solace in looking at as long as I'm, you know, acting consciously, mindfully for in the highest good for my family, my children and myself, then, um, then I should take action and be less attached to then the outcome of the action. So that's been a really, really supportive one for me. I love that. And I feel like that can apply to so much. Like I'm thinking of entrepreneurship as well. We get really frozen of like, should I do this thing or that thing? Or what it should it look perfect? Whether we're creating a website or sending out an email and you're right. Like just taking some action makes it makes it easier. Oh, I love the story. Yeah. How it, um, yeah. What do you he- What are you hearing right now from newer parents as like the things that they're dealing with, the challenges that you're seeing right now with people? Yep. So in Australia, there's a lot of um, publicity in the media at the moment, um, there's been investigation into birth trauma. So that's quite, it's really good that there's a lot more talk happening about that now and it's there's some awareness being raised and all that. Um, and it's really, I can, I'm really seeing clients I'm working with now and coming through in their pregnancy phase are uh, really starting to become more aware of the birth choices, what choices they have, um, that there are options that they can speak up for themselves. Um, but then what they're finding in doing so is that the generation that's gone before them, which were very much just taught to trust the system and, you know, trust your medical provider or whatever it is, um, are really pushing back. And that's generally the the grandparents or grandparents to be, and the um, or the uncles, aunts, whoever it is that's in their in their life, uh, and oh, the the challenge of standing in your truth, finding your truth, and being able to sift through what is your truth versus what is your condition, and you think it is. Um, but yeah, definitely having a lot of conversations around that. And to bring that back to the yoga philosophy that comes to Satya, which is true. Um, and that then, I think it's great if those conversations can be had in the prenatal period and to help um, people who are birthing parents or even the support parent who's seeing their um, their partner go through this internal turmoil essentially and wanting to make sure they're safe as well that fear of are they going to be safe through this process and then coming out the other side of that um whether there was moments where that truth was um explored that everything shifts that that massive identity change occurs and seeing so many people coming out the other side thinking that they were going to be their identity was going to be a certain way. So maybe it was a like um, someone who's uh, a real career person and looking, thinking, oh, yep, three months, Bob's going to go to daycare, I'm going to be to work straight back in, you know, continuing on with my career, but I've got this beautiful child. They have the baby and then all of a sudden they're like, no, I, I want 12 months off. I, this is not what I wanted. But at the same time, them feeling so much shame and guilt for that, for almost like they're turning back on their own words, so to speak. Mm. I think that really now is a key a key theme or idea that um, needs a lot of speaking to and that 
people who are journeying through matrescence need more support in because um, it's not something that's really talked about um, or that you're warned about during during pregnancy or when you start thinking about having a family that, um, again, no matter whether you're the birthing person or not, there will be a massive identity shift and there'll be pieces of you that need to fall away that you might want to think you were going to keep and there'll be new, but the the thing is by shedding those there's beautiful opportunities of what can become a new part of your identity as well so um yeah so i think there's there's so much um in yoga philosophy that can support we've already talked about some of the letting go and the shedding but there's also then that um and again a lot of what i teach is around like the cyclical nature of life and living that in the letting go, there's that opportunity to start again. When I talk about that in the concept of tapas, and tapas is probably the one where I've really um, maybe gone a little bit away from the the really what I saw in the lineages I was taught with yoga um, were very very masculine interpretation of those of that term term in terms of it being an idea of discipline or that real fire. Um, and it's definitely fire. It's definitely discipline. But I, I think of it more from um, at this stage of life, the discipline to um, actually take that moment and look at what is for the highest good. So where in the past, um, it, it, let's use the career-driven person as an example, where in the past it was like keep pushing, keep going, you know, keep hustling. All of a sudden, it's like, no, the energy needs to be balanced. I need to step back, I need to soften for my child. I need to, you know, um, and it's uh, that in itself is a discipline to be able to identify that, that there needs to be this shift and to be able to actually step into and let go of those things. So, um, yeah, those are definitely um, on on either side of the, the actual birth. Those are two big ones that um, that I see a lot of. I love looking at tapas a little different because you're right. The moment I think of it in terms of yoga philosophy, I'm like, well, it's like, you know, if you're if you're doing a yoga practice, like to stick with it and kind of give your best or like wake up every day and do your yoga practice. And definitely for parenting, I feel like it is much more about going with some type of flow. Like if you go at parenting with like just this like bullheaded um the the word discipline sounds like it like it sounds really harsh you're right it doesn't it doesn't feel the same and i also think that comes yeah. from like years of parenting where you're like oh yeah discipline's going to mean something very different than what you think i don't know it feels like it i like the word softening that you used that if our, and I think if, it even, sorry, sorry, I was just going to say, like, if our work was like, can we soften? Can we soften? Can that be the, the thing that we keep coming back to? Sorry, what were you going to say? Yeah, that's right. Um, I think there's two things I wanted to say around that. One is, and uh, this is part one of the practices that I teach to do with tuppers is, it's there is still the discipline in showing up but it's showing up to what is for the highest good right now. So it's almost taking it that one step further. So you might show up to your yoga practice each day and that is the the fire element of, you know, being there and making it there. But then going, um, if you think about, say, uh, for someone who who has a menstrual cycle, going up to their yoga practice every day is not going to be supportive to do a strong vinyasa practice every day of the month. Um, so it's starting to think about, okay, well, if it's, if they're bleeding, maybe it needs to be a really, just some breathing and a meditation. Uh, maybe it's a restorative pose and it would be the same for motherhood, you know, um, uh, or parenthood, sorry. If you, um, some days you do need to show up and do a strong practice if you're thinking about the physical practice, because there's a re-energizing of the, the birthing muscles, the core muscles that needs to happen. But then the next day you have had no sleep for 24 hours. <laughs> right. The discipline is not going, but I need my core back. The discipline is going, I need to rest. I need child's pose. I need my legs up the wall and I need to take long exercise. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, yeah, so it's really getting people to start thinking in that respect because I really believe as a parent or as anyone in this crazy, busy, fast-track society we're in, there's more discipline now in actually, rather than thinking you might, in actually stopping and meditating for five minutes than there is in doing stopping and doing 10 squats, for example. I think the the first of those is harder. <laughs> I think you're that's right discipline. for most people. <laughs> okay, you also said the words showing up. I love that. That's really good. I'm thinking of how the difference it make it has made for me to show up and be present, especially as we got into teenage years, which sometimes just meant like being in the same room, just being there. If the teenagers were like, yep, now's going to be the time to talk. That showing up looks very different than it does when it's like, okay, the baby that you have to show up for. Okay. I love that. Showing up and softening. Those are two two things. Also, you mentioned the trauma piece. And I just want to say um, one of the most powerful things that I was ever part of around birth trauma is um, holding space for a whole group of people who had recently had their babies, but it didn't have to be, it didn't have to be recent. That was the key thing. We did I led this group and it could be like at any point in your life, you had birthed a baby, whether you were bringing that baby with you or, and it was a, there was no time constraint on the circle and everyone was just going to talk about their birth experience. And I just remember how powerful that was because in that moment, not everyone wants to hear your birth story. Like, you know, you go to town, you go grocery shopping and it's, very validating when you can share with another group of people. And it was, there was a lot of emotion, a lot of feeling going around in the circle. Um, and, and the people that were there said that they thought that they were all alone in feeling this way until, well, this is years ago as well. And I'm sure things have changed with like making birth choices. How, what if, what is your experience around this? Um, and how are you helping people to navigate that birth trauma? Yeah, so um, I guess the number one thing I would say is that if I identify that there's some significant impact from that, I would I have um, I might go out of my way to make sure I have a network of um, counselors and psychologists that I can refer them to for the right yeah. support. And I've also done additional training myself through. We have a wonderful. Um, group in Australia called the Centre of Perinatal Excellence, which um, uh, you can do some free training actually as someone who works in the perinatal space just so you can identify the signs and um, use some of the basic questioning tools and then be able to send them to the right support. So I think that's that's really important. Um, I can't speak for other areas of the world, but um, I know in Australia, COPE is doing an amazing job there. Um, but I think in terms of yeah, in a in a yoga class setting, uh, you're right. Like it's um, and the, definitely the way that I teach the uh, practical yoga philosophy for parenthood is more like a sharing circle. So rather than like everyone's mat's really linear and we're just doing this practice and we're in our own little space, we're in a circle. Maybe there's babies there, maybe there's not, and um, there's a lot of opportunity for sharing, similar to how we've been doing around whatever. Uh, philosophy topic we're talking about and little bits of experiencing the topic and I think as people then settle into the topic and experience it these things just come out naturally when they're feeling in that safe environment when they're starting to interact with these concepts um, people do start to find it to be a safe space to discuss these things and to feel that um there's other people who are in it with them, so to speak, and going through that. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, not even just in the birth trauma space, but trauma in general, yoga can, um, a well-facilitated yoga environment can be somewhere where people do um, feel a little bit more empowered to um, start to process some of these things. And for some people that is in sharing. For some people it's even just um, 
knowing there's other people in the room who may have gone through something similar, even if they don't actually share themselves. Yeah. It it was a powerful thing for me to, I remember going to like a, my first baby and me group with other people. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I finally feel like these people understand what I'm going through. And those were some of the strongest connections um, at that time. I I had had my babies before my friends from high school did, most of them. And, you know, they were like, oh, yeah, I'm still off at college. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm like deciding on cloth or not diapers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can be really isolating. Um, I love how you also said to have those supports there for when you see like if someone is really overwhelmed and they're coming to you and telling you um, it's good to know like here's how we can help and then here's also the network of help in our community. Um, yeah, for sure, yeah. Can I speak to the yeah. isolation point yes. a little bit more? I really think that... Um, it's just, I uh, love how you were um, sharing that. Thank you. Um, I guess isolation is such a big part of what can be the experience of motherhood. And even though we are such a connected society now, it almost can isolate people further when they feel like they're not living up to these ideals. And that's where, yeah, these face-to-face connections or discussions can be really supportive. Um, and I think it also highlights because yoga is about the opposite of that, about coming back from separation and isolation towards connection and um, community and unity, um, that the perinatal time is a time that I find where many people come to yoga who've never done or experienced yoga before. And that's another reason why I'm really passionate about when they are coming and finding yoga at that point in time that they're finding the whole of yoga, not just an exercise class. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, I guess I just wanted to throw that in because I think as yoga teachers, this this period of life for someone is a really wonderful opportunity to share with them the eight limbs, all the things, not just exercise, yeah. And um, I think for someone who has already practiced yoga and comes to this point and is coming to a yoga class, it can help them to broaden their experience of yoga into those fields because there's, you're definitely looking for something more than just movement on the mat um, at that point in your life. That's amazing. I feel like you and I could talk for a long time about this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, if our connected yoga teachers want to learn more about philosophy and how to weave this into their classes, whether it's with, you know, fertility, prenatal, postnatal, um, perinatal, where do they find you? Sure. So, um, so I think I mentioned at the start, I'm um, the center of Bright Beginnings. And so they can just look up my website and there's plenty of information and links on there. And then for the online component of the Practical Yoga Philosophy for Parenthood program that I've kind of alluded to um, throughout our discussion, I've partnered with uh, Bliss Baby Yoga. Some people may have, um, have heard of them before. They're wonderful um, pre and postnatal yoga teacher training um, online. And uh, their founder, Anna Davis, is actually uh, a mentor for me. She's um, a wealth of wisdom in the feminine yoga space. And um, so the online program is, I've, I've come up with it and kind of done most of the content, but Anna has collaborated and she comes into it as well. So you get that added bonus of her of her wealth of wisdom and that's on the Bliss Baby Yoga website. But you can just find it all through my website as well and i obviously be able to share that all with you, Gannon, for the listeners. Um, I'm also, I would love to offer any of the listeners a discount for the course to um, if, they, if they would like to. The, the course for the online one can be uh, done both as a person journeying through matrescence or a support person or as a yoga teacher. So um, in the yoga teacher part, uh, sorry, if you're doing it as a yoga teacher, there's an additional section which is um, which actually gives you all the tools to facilitate it yourself as well. So um, basically a uh, 10-week program all set up ready to go for you to give you some way to start. Oh, well, that's amazing. So people can also do this through their own pregnancy journey. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Or mm-hmm. anytime in parenthood. Anytime in parenthood, yeah. yeah right. Sure. I mean, if, if someone actually started in the fertility and went the whole way through, they'd get like the absolute most out of it. But, right. but coming to it in parenthood is uh, is perfect as well, yeah. Okay. Well, that's amazing. We'll link to those in the show notes. Thank you so much. I think this is a really important area. Like when we support the people who are raising the next generation, it makes a big difference. And I want to say to our connected yoga teacher listeners, like, you know, sometimes teaching a baby and me class can feel like it's just chaos happening here. Is it really making a difference? It does. It makes such a difference. I've had students come up to me years later. Some of their kids are like (laughs) almost 20 (laughs) and say like, that was the first time when I was, I felt like I was like just moving and breathing with these other parents. I really felt like I was part of something and it helped me beyond anything they ever said at the time. So it it really can make an impact. Thank you so much for doing this work. Thank you to you as well, Shannon, and for everything you're doing, both sharing yoga in all its facets and um, also with the pelvic health professionals. I think that's a really important part for anyone who's working in the perinatal space as well. Oh my goodness, Claire, thank you so much for this conversation today, for really talking through some of these aspects of being a parent. It brought back so much for me. If our listeners don't already know, I really specialized in this area. So when I became a yoga teacher, I realized that I wanted to focus and work with pregnant yoga students. That's what led me to teaching pelvic health. I was working with a lot of pregnant people or postpartum people. And this episode just reminded me of my days of parenting little children or smaller children and reminded me of the difference that my students would tell me that a class would make if they could just come and spend some time in their body breathing, moving together with other parents. So to those of you who are teaching to parents or if you're a parent yourself, hats off for the amazing work you're doing If any of you want to share how yoga is helping you, I would love to hear about that in our comment section of this episode. That's over at theconnectedyogateacher.com slash 373, or you can leave us a voice message, or you can leave us all a message in the Connected Yoga Teacher Facebook group. If you're looking for that, head over to theconnectedyogateacher.com and you'll see the join button right from our homepage. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, we love it when you leave a review for it. Sometimes we read those on the podcast as well. Tell us like what you're enjoying about the podcast, how we could improve. Tell us your thoughts on a specific episode. Anything you want, you can put in there in your review. If you want to hang out in real time, we have a call coming up inside our Pelvic Health Professional Membership. That's happening June the 10th. Dr. Lisa Folden is coming in to talk with us about weight-inclusive fitness and wellness care. I think this is such an important topic. We're trying to make our classes and our spaces accessible and inclusive. And this is one of the conversations that we need to continue to have to be able to do that. Also this month, we had a live call with Brittany Sharp McCollum where we talked about how to support our pregnant or postpartum people. And that was done by Brittany Sharp McCollum. The replay is ready for you if you want to check that out. You can head on over to pelvichealthprofessionals.com to grab access to both of those calls. And let me share um, like a little bit of what's going on behind the scenes. So as I said at the top of today's episode, things are changing with pelvic health professionals. I don't really know what that's fully going to look like, but I do know that I needed to make space for a big project that I'm trying to work on. I've been trying to work on it for a while, but (laughs) as with any niching down work that I've talked about over the last seven years on this podcast and as I've learned as an entrepreneur, Sometimes you have to let things go that, you know, have brought a lot of joy and energy and pelvic health professionals is definitely one of those things. I'm still super passionate (laughs) about pelvic health and yoga and bringing those two worlds together. But I know right now that someone else 
kind of with a renewed sense of that energy or like that's their main focus of their business, they would be able to do a better job of this. So maybe that person's out there and that's why we're having conversations with some of our members who have been in there for years. We're having conversations with them first to see if anyone wants to take this over as a business. We kind of have the whole outline there. We've done some yoga series. We've done five of them with some amazing yoga teachers. We've seen how that's really taken off. And so some of you might be thinking, well, Shannon, why aren't you sticking with it then? (laughs) Believe me, that has held me to this. Like probably for the last year, I realize the connections that happen in there, the education that's happening how it's impacting people and their students and their their pelvic health. I hear all of those amazing things. Also, this is a business that has a ton of potential. You know, <laughs> it's amazing. When I've talked to business coaches about this business, they're like, you don't have a freebie. You're not building your email list with this or you're not doing this or that. This business does really well on its own, but... I have a big project that I really want to focus on. And I'll tell you here now, because I feel like you've listened all the way to the end of today's podcast. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but I do know that whatever it is that I'm building is going to be very focused on, this is an in-person thing that I'm doing, very focused on, I mean, it might have an online portion, we'll see. (laughs) But for now, it's in person. Focusing on how to connect people more with nature, how to teach people how to grow food, growing food personally, like I love growing food. Anyone who follows me on Instagram, you know that I like to be out in nature and I love to garden and grow food. I used to run a farmer's market for five years and have a two acre garden. So it's not like I don't know what I'm doing with it, but I will tell you that it was scary to decide, yeah, I'm going to leap back into that and do that again. And shout out to my good friend Shulami because she encouraged me to really feel into this decision. And also we had Shulami on the podcast, so I'll, I'll link to her episode. But she also encouraged me to not try and rush it, which I was trying to do. I was trying to get everything set up for this spring to like launch this idea that I have and it's not ready yet. <laughs> And so like nature and gardening, sometimes things take a little bit longer to germinate. So I will keep you in the loop as much as I can. If you want to follow along, you can follow me on Instagram. And if you have questions for me, ask me the questions because I know many of you, you might have an idea for a business in your mind. It might be connected to yoga or it might be something totally different. And sometimes it's scary to make that leap. I can definitely share what has helped me along the way. Okay, before I sign off here, Connected Yoga Teachers, I want to tell you about a post that Claire shared, and I saved it because we had done our podcast interview, and I thought when I post that interview, I'd love to share her words here because I think it's really powerful. It was powerful for me that day to read it, and it has to do with speaking up right now, especially for a free Palestine. So Claire had shared this post and I'll link to it in our show notes and you can go and follow Claire on Instagram and also show her some love on this post if it also resonates with you. So Claire said, yoga doesn't call upon us to fix things, but it does ask us not to turn a blind eye when we see injustice and suffering. To practice ahimsa, non-harm, and satya, speaking from truth. If the genocide in Gaza moves you, please speak about it, even if it's just with your friends and family. Have the courage, even such a simple act can make a difference. And this is why, Connected Yoga Teachers, that I keep speaking about Palestine here on the podcast and about Gaza and the West Bank. And this is why I keep continuing to listen and bear witness and learn because I do see the difference it's making. So I get messages all the time now from friends, from family, from podcast listeners 
who tell me that they started to learn more about Palestine because of a post I shared or an episode we've done or a conversation that I've had with someone. It is making a difference. And if anyone is telling you that posting or talking about this isn't making a difference, I would really question that. This week, I called my local government representative again. (laughs) We've talked three times about this now. And at one point in the conversation, I mean, it was a long conversation. I appreciate that Alex Ruff took the time to even listen to me or talk to me. I feel like sometimes our views and our values maybe are not the same, but he's super respectful in the conversations. And at one point I was talking about the current news about our university students here in Canada and also the college students in the U.S. who are protesting and asking that their universities not invest the tuition that they've given them toward weapons. And my local government rep was like, what are you talking about? I didn't know that was happening. So that's the thing. We learn in community. It's not about one person having all of the answers. This is a government official who I think, government official, is that what he is? A government representative uh, that I think gets a lot of information thrown at him. And he didn't know about that. And so I know that it takes some time and it can be really tough and difficult to have these chats And I also will say that if someone starts to really shut you down when you are speaking up right now for the safety and freedom for 600,000 children, that's not on you. That's on them. For me, I know that I'm going to continue to speak up as someone who has studied yoga philosophy. It's woven right in there as part of yoga for me. It's very connected to that. You know, I can definitely look at how I'm speaking, how I'm sharing this. I can definitely take a look and reevaluate over and over again. But I also know at the same time that that's what I need to do right now. Okay, it is time for me to get back out to the garden, actually. I've got some gardening things to do. But before I do that, I want to say a huge thank you to Suzanne Crunch and Sinead for making this podcast possible. And I also want to thank you, dear listener, for being here all the way to the end, to listening to my big news today, to having the time to really hang out with Claire and learn about yoga philosophy and parenthood and to just really be here and connect. Thank you for that. And as usual, I want to close today's episode with a question. What will you be doing this week to stay connected to yourself your yoga practice, and to your community so that you can share the yoga that lights you up.